everyone. Hiya. Um, I'm delighted to um, welcome Design Manchester here to the University of Salford today. Um, we're very proud to be um, um, university partners with them um, this year and um, we're really looking forward to the panel discussion and um, it's especially relevant being about the future of work. Um, I think for you all as students here in the audience, I think it's really useful just to find out what is really happening and obviously with some of the questions that we're going to be exploring today, what may be happening in the future. So um, we're, we're very much interested in industry partnerships at Salford. Um, we've got this beautiful new building that we just moved into and certainly in terms of our industry collaboration zones, um, we're very keen on having industry um, partnerships within all of our programmes across the university. So to be able to host this as part of the Design Manchester Festival, it's really exciting. So I'll pass you over to Casper, um, who's um, one of the Design Manchester directors. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. And um, I would like to also welcome you all, and not only you, but also our fabulous uh, live YouTube audience, uh, to this uh, great event, part of uh, our, the fifth annual uh, design festival uh, in Manchester and it's really great this year that we have been able to um, develop our relationship with uh, the University of Salford School of Art and Media uh, and that we're having this great event here. At Design Manchester we are interested in all aspects of design in all sectors and all disciplines and in getting people to understand design isn't something that only sits in culture or in television or in engineering or in architecture or in textiles. It sits across all of those different things. And so every festival we do like to look at different aspects of design. Um, and this year we've been looking at architecture and textiles and music. There's a great Buzzcocks gig tomorrow night if you still, still haven't got your tickets. Um, and a, a, a whole range of other things. At the heart of all of this, what we're really interested in is how design can make a great contribution to the city and what are the opportunities for design and creative talent. Uh, and the future of that is absolutely central. So creative careers is something that we're very interested in. So I'm really delighted that this year we're starting a discussion uh, about um, uh, the future of work. <laughs> about the future of work. And so I'd like to hand over to Lou Thank you very much. Casper. Oh, that's me or you, Casper. I'm not quite sure which one. Ho hopefully not me. Um, so um, th thanks, everyone, for um, coming today. Uh, we're really excited about today's event. Our hope is actually that this will be the first of its kind and that this will become a regular event that we hold every year, depending on how much you enjoy it and how much you get out of it. So ho hopefully we'll be here this time next year. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to talk about this topic. It's a really exciting and important time for the industry at large, as, as Casper's outlined, and also for the city. You know, we've got a new mayor who's very passionate about the design and digital and creative industries. Uh, he's uh, stated our ambition to be the UK's number one digital city. Uh, so, you know, all eyes on Manchester and Greater Manchester to kind of lead the way on a lot of these things. And how uh, we engage new and young talent is a really um, critical part of, of that whole equation. So. I'm going to briefly introduce our panel today. Uh, the format's going to um, run a, a, a little bit along the lines of some presentations, some brief presentations from everybody who's here, just to introduce the organisations they represent and talk a little bit about uh, how they engage talent um, w within their own programmes. We're going to have um, some questions from myself to the panel and some discussion, and then we've allowed um, some time at the end for um, hopefully lots of questions from you uh, uh, about the organisations and the people and their own personal experiences. Okay, so uh, without further ado, can I introduce, first of all, um, Jay Murison, who is head of UX and D, user experience and design, for anybody who doesn't know what that means, at the BBC. Um, we've got Claire, uh, who's head of talent at Co-op Digital, which I'm sure Claire's going to talk all about what Co-op Digital is within the organisation. Jed uh, Kazza, who's uh, as well as heading up um, BDP, which is um, a hugely internationally respected architecture firm in Manchester. He also is the principal and the president of the uh, Manchester Architects Association. Um, and then we've got Sarah Brooks Pierce, who's future talent manager at Auto Trader, also a massive digital employer in the city. And then we've got, a, um, I'm excited to have a different voice uh, with us today. So Tessa, who is actually freelance, but works a lot with organizations like ITV as a director on uh, the stuff we consume every night, programs like um, Corrie. So 
Um, can, I, can I begin by just asking everybody to do kind of 60 seconds just on yourselves and kind of what your role encompasses before we get into the presentation? Is that okay? Great. Is this going to work? It <gasps> is. Hooray. I love a microphone. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, I'm Jane Murison. Um, so, uh, as Lou said, I'm uh, one of the heads of user experience and design at the BBC. Um, the team up in Salford is about 75 strong of UX designers of different stripes, um, and it covers a bunch of different specialisms all about creating digital experiences. So, um, within that, we've got visual designers, branding, um, prototyping, um, user experience, architecture, which is, you know, plumbing strategic plumbing <laughs> and uh, UX writing uh, and design research, which is one of the teams I look after. So uh, in that, what else am I supposed to be doing? I've forgotten what you said I was supposed to do. That's, is that that's enough? enough? Okay, I'm going to stop. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Save the rest of presentation. <laughs> Hi there, um, I'm Claire Gallagher um, and I'm one of the heads of HR at Cope um, Group in Manchester. And I support a number of areas, but one of them is Co-op Digital, which I'll talk a bit more about when I do my presentation. Um, my role there really is to kind of start, uh, is to look at the strategy around HR and our talent and what's coming up and as well as getting involved in a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, operational stuff to make sure that, you know, our kind of leaders and our colleagues are all supported. Uh, my name is Jed Cowser. Um, I'm an architect uh, principal uh, at BDP based in the Manchester studio. I'm actually born in Salford, so I'm kind of Salford, sort of um, Salford lad. Um, I'm also the um, president of all the uh, uh, Manchester Architect kind of association. Uh, uh, so, we, so we, as a group, we represent all the architects in in Manchester. We have exhibitions, we have awards, we have lots of events sort of throughout the year. So I've, I can have a pretty good sort of feel for what's happening in the profession. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about that later. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sarah from Auto Trader. Um, I'm also born in Salford. Um, I, um, <laughs> my role at Auto Trader is just to look after future talent and look at the different ways we can bring talent into the business. So, a complete focus on graduates, apprentices, and how we can bring people in for career changes and those entry points into the organisation. Hi, I'm Tessa. I'm from New Zealand, but I have been living and working in, in the UK for about 15 years. I'm a freelance television director and a filmmaker. So I work for a lot of, I work for BBC, Channel 4, ITV, um, and I've just got back from directing my first TV series in the US. Um, and I make films as well. So, but I am freelance. I don't work for one company. I work for a lot of different people. Thanks, everyone. So um, I'm going to um, go into presentations, if that's, if that's all right with everyone. We're going to start with um, Jane from the BBC. Mic roll, mic roll. Hello, it's because the clicker's over here. Right. Hi. Hello. <sighs> okay. Um, so we are BBC UX and D. I'm going to take you through some of the stuff that we do and I'm going to talk about what size team we've got and stuff like that. So, um, here are some of the things that we make. Um, that bit at the bottom is us <coughs> pointing towards a hierarchy because we think a lot about our global experience language as well. Um, but the other things that we do are probably a bit more uh, recognisable. This is all stuff that happens in Salford. So, um, we deal with all the screens for sport, for example, and what you can see here is all the campaign stuff that we put together for Rio a few years ago, and all the way through from mobile experience all the way to TV. And um, when you come and work at the BBC as a UX person, the first thing we do is hand you a BBC UX and D handbook and talk about our values and how we work in that group. What we're looking for is um, people who understand creative process. That's it. Like everything else is a specialism beyond that. Like the technology that we work with is moving at such a pace that actually whatever you pick up at university or whatever you're picking up throughout your career, it's probably going to change. It's probably going to be obsolete in a while. So um, if you go in with the, uh, with the idea that your skills need to be sort of set and fixed, um, 
that's never going to happen. You're going to have to continue to um, modulate what you're doing and understand the world. But if you can do that with a creative process in mind, then you can continue to be a useful person and earn money um, in, in a role for a long time. So um, what we're trying to do is set up a team that allows that to happen all the time, um, that allows us all to learn and continue to learn. So one of our objectives this year is to um, be designers of the future. And by that, we mean uh, give ourselves uh, kind of um, permission to be scared and go and do things we're not very good at yet and learn how to get better at them. Um, so this is, this is my office. Isn't it fancy? No, it's all right. Um, those wheel things are not practically that useful. Um, <laughs> what happens is you sit back on it and you're like, oh, my back's in a funny position now. Um, but, you know, flexible working, right? It's fine. Um, it's a very nice building to work in. I should, sh I should shut up. Uh, so most of our teams are about this size, maybe somewhere a bit bigger, because what they're doing is they're embedded in different products, so they'll be working with groups of lots of other people and collaborating really closely uh, with developers and uh, producers, people who are writing editorial content, and people uh, of all, all sorts of skill set. Um, so we embed these little teams, um, but our bigger team is about this size, so it's about 180 people across the country, um, which is... Seems like quite a lot, it's quite a big team, uh, especially for UX, it's one of the biggest teams in the country, probably unless you're talking about you know, Google and Facebook and UBS and those guys. Um, but actually we're in, <laughs> this is, and you can count them, this is about the 18,000 employees that the BBC has. So in relation to how many people we need to work with and impact, we're tiny. Um, we've got a lot to do. And then when you think about how many people in the country we're serving on a weekly basis, 97% of the UK is consuming, U uh, is consuming BBC content on a weekly basis. And when you go worldwide, it's even more. Um, so at that point, our wee team of 180 people has to pick, quite, has to pack quite a large punch, really. Um, yeah, seems quite small when you look at it that way. Um, so we've got quite a lot to do to get us to work together. We, we do it in a number of ways. Um, but our, our main way is uh, to act like a team in multiple directions. So you can be part of the children's team working with developers and with program makers and children's, but you're also part of the UX team. And you've got friends all the time and you're able to rotate and go, I've done children's for a bit. And now to keep my skills fluid and keep learning more, I can go and work in sport or I can go and work with interactive TV. I can do other things and keep developing that way. Um, and we also uh, meet regularly in other ways. We have regular studio days where everybody goes and pretends that we're like a cool digital agency, like lose one where, you know, there's music playing and people talk to each other. No, people talk to each other anyway, but um, we bring all of the UX designers into one room and do that on a regular basis. And then on a semi-regular basis, we all get together and try and work out how to join together in creative ways. So this one on the left is us creating the Plasticine City, which we did to talk about reuse and consistency and how we architect things. So it's not just having fun, I promise. Um, and on the right was uh, a challenge to create a maze and how we might kind of do that as separate teams and join it all together into one architected thing. And it was really cool as well. Um, this is, oh, this is some of the specialists. How much time have I got? I've already talked too long, haven't I? Five, five. I can just rant forever. I'll throw um, something when it's time to throw. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the thing to say, we've also got to kind of behave flexibly in our thinking. So. Uh, yeah, everyone's a UX designer, but everyone gets to be a design researcher, an architect, a prototype at different times in their career. So this is where some of our UX designers are um, testing an interactive television concept in the foyer of one of the buildings, and they just stole one of the BBC tour groups and said, would you mind having a wee look at this, please? Um, so we did some user research with them. But beyond that, we were also doing user research with we brought a bag of um, remote controls with us and then using a piece of software that one of the guys on the team had developed, um, we could span their own, the remote control that they were most used to to work with the TV. So by using those prototyping skills, we could create a more realistic user experience and test them on the fly. So that's why I wanted to show that picture. 
Um, so it's all about flexibility uh, of mindset and kind of allowing yourself to think, yes, I could be on this team and do this thing. We've got qualified architects, like building architects. We've got physical designers. We've got people with backgrounds in economy and coding and all sorts of different things. Um, the only thing kind of limiting your ability to come and work for us is whether or not you think you're allowed to really. Show us how, the, how your creativity is and you can come and join our team, absolutely. And if you really do want to, it's a team of 75 people. So sure, there's maybe three jobs right now being advertised in Salford. Don't worry about that too much because there's going to be another one along in a minute. You know, Our churn rate is not horrifying, but there are new jobs turning up all the time. If you're interested and you've got an interesting CV, come and speak to don't talk to me because I'm very disorganized. Email it to Andy, <laughs> who's our hiring person. Um, the other thing is we have a design trainee program uh, that runs every year. We have just had a new intake, so that would be early next year that that would open up again. It's highly competitive, but um, there are other ways if that sounds a bit distressing. Um, it is a fantastic program, though. We have a year. Uh, we usually get somewhere in the region of about 900 applicants for about six places. So it is competitive, but that is another route in. That's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Claire, you've got the clicker. Yeah. Okay, great. It must be the one doing it. It looks that way. <laughs> I can't remember what it is. <laughs> I support Coop Digital. I wouldn't actually claim that I'm very techy, <laughs> so I can struggle with this thing. Here we go. Cool. Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm um, I work in HR at the head office in Manchester, and I joined just a little over a year ago. Um, and my kind of main driver to join the co-op was that they are really kind of looking at how do we actually digitalise the co-op for the kind of next generation. Um, so. I wanted to give you a little bit of history about the co-op because I didn't really know an awful lot when I joined a year or so ago um, as to how much is actually involved in that organisation. So we aren't just shops and I have to admit for some time I thought we were because they're on every kind of street corner. Um, they, we do have other businesses. We have a really startling picture of the, our original Rochdale pioneers. Um, they were actually founded in Rochdale. Um, it's about 173 years ago, and that's how the co-op came about. Um, they they seen a gap in the market is probably the best way to describe it in today's terms. Um, there were unscrupulous shopkeepers at the time um, who were contaminating food. So they started out by going out and buying flour and um, butter and selling it straight to the customers. It, so it was good food at good prices. And they also set up a classroom above their shop to teach people to read and write. Um, which was just some of the, a couple of the things that they did that kind of really started that, that social um, piece around the co-op. But you can find out more if you go online as well. I have to stick with my notes, sorry about that. Um, our difference um, is that we aren't, um, we're not shareholder owned. So we have just over four and a half million members um, and that's growing every day. The opportunity to be a membership is there for everybody, um, so you can get involved in our democracy, you can shape the future of the co-op, um, but you can equally get something back for that. So you may have membership cards, some of you, if you don't, students get an extra 10% off um, products in shops, so it might be worth thinking about that. Um, but 5% it will get repaid back to you, and 1% of everything that you spend goes to a local charity in your community, which you can choose. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out. Um, this is our head office, which most of you probably would have seen. Some people think it looks like a ship. <laughs> I don't really know what it looks like, but it's very cool inside. Um, and we're actually one of the largest co-ops um, in the world. So we've got over 70,000 colleagues working for us, the majority in our stores and in funeral care. Um, our businesses. So taking us beyond the fact that we have shops, we have a funeral care business. Um, this is actually the funeral director's own costume. Um, which I thought was a, a great pick and the personalisation they did around that funeral. Um, we've also got legal services, um, we've got insurance products and we've got co-op electrical. These are our co-op values and our ways of being. So they were created with and by our colleagues, um, for our colleagues and we call it our winning formula. 
So everything we do in terms of the work that we do every day and how we behave, it is about doing what matters most and always being ourselves, and that's really encouraged and showing that we care and succeeding together. So that team environment and actually making sure we're not just out looking at our own piece of work. Specifically around digital and the digital coop team, um, they are primarily there working on projects that make a difference to our businesses, communities and members. Um, they, they're really looking at how can we actually enable and make colleagues' lives easier through technology. So we have a few things here that actually I don't work on these things because I'm sitting in HR, so I see the product at the end. Um, so I'm probably not best equipped to be able to kind of go into the detail of how we've got there. But we have Wills Online. Um, and the only thing I can say about this is I've used it. It wasn't something I really wanted to think about that's doing a will, but it made it really easy, straightforward. Um, so I, it's worth checking out. Um, location services is another product that the digital team have introduced for our stores. Believe it or not, we didn't have anything like that before. So um, if you wanted to search where your local co-op is, what the opening times are and what services they have, for example, a bakery, you wouldn't have been able to do that before. Um, so there was a lot of phone calls to stores to find out that kind of information. Our food business is our largest part of the co-op. And we're doing a lot of work with them about how we can make colleagues' lives easier. Um, this is a, project, a product range finder that we did initially within digital. There was like, hundreds of calls coming in every, every month about you know, different product ranges. So we've introduced this to be able to help the stores to be able to find information easier. And we're now looking into user needs to digitalise the back office in food and in those stores. It's, it's quite archaic, the way things are done in behind there. So it takes store managers and the colleagues away from that, that customer experience. And we're prototyping a service that helps colleagues as well. So it's not just about the back office piece. Um, to see their schedule, to be able to book holidays, and to be able to request extra shifts as well. And another part of our business is funeral care. Um, the work we're doing with them really, again, is along a similar theme. It is about simplifying back office and the admin to align our funeral directors and our teams to be able to actually get out there and actually do what they need to do and what they do best, which is looking after families when they're at the time that they need it most. So the people behind this are our amazing team. We've got our developers, and I've put some mug shots in here because I just thought that might just be a bit more interesting. We've got our user experience. Um, so we've got our designers and our researchers. We've got delivery managers. And we've got our platform engineers, our business analysts, and of course our data scientists, which is an area that we're growing considerably as well. And now this is a bit of a shameless plug <laughs> around what vacancies we do have. So currently, we are on the lookout for platform engineers, quality analysts, principal software engineers, user researchers, and data analytics teams. So if that's something that you're interested in, there is more information on our blog. And there's also more information in there around our apprenticeship scheme, which is definitely worth checking out if that's something that you might be considering. And the last piece that I wanted to do while I had your attention was really to talk about the federation building that we've just introduced within Manchester. It's, um, it's a community and that, that's actually not owned and governed by the co-op, but we've supported it so that we can create this digital hub within Manchester. Anybody that works within it, um, so we've got kind of small startup companies, one, two people up to software um, organizations that are global, have to adhere to our cooperative values. Um, so it's a real shared space. But in terms of events and talks that we are holding there, it's worth checking out the website because there's, there's some free events that you could go along to as well. And we're just about to open a nice cafe in the middle of it, so you might want to pop in for a cuppa in a couple of weeks. And that was me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming along this afternoon. Um, I can absolutely endorse the Federation building as a space. I went there for the first time this week uh, for the Design Manchester launch, and it was just it was a brilliant place. Um, I'm not quite sure when the cafe opens, but it's definitely, definitely worth a, worth a visit. So I'm going to talk to you about, um, about what, what we do um, as BDP from Manchester, uh, also about what an architect does um, and what he might do sort of in the future. And also, I'm going to give you some new, new news about new ways of getting into the profession, because there, there is a kind of a revolution that's happening, um, hopefully to make the, make the profession more accessible and more, more inclusive. 
I'll give you some more detail about that. But I have an eight-minute brief, so I'm going to get on with it. <laughs> um, we're a big corporate organisation, so we're, that's where we're based. Actually, we're not. We're, we're based there, which is on Juicy Street, which is around the corner from Piccadilly Station. We've got about 150 people that work in there, about 60 architects. And we've got all the professions that BDP does, which is everything. CNS, m and &E, sustainability, ecology. Um, but the architects do some pretty special work. And we were formed, launched about 50 years ago by this guy, Sir George Grofield Baines, uh, who's based in Preston. And he set up the office above a shop. Um, and uh, within the last two years, we've just been bought out by a firm called Nippard Coey. They're a massive um, civil engineering uh, firm. They're actually about three times the size of BDP. Um, <laughs> and we, we're now working with them to, to work on a more sort of global scale, which is really exciting. So that's where we operate in the world, um, from Manchester and from BDP. Yeah, it's a really exciting place to be. Um, and there are a number of practices in that kind of category within the city and within the region. And we do some fantastic work, uh, mostly award-winning. So this is Alder Hay, which is a project that I've um, handed over about two years ago now. Uh, there's Box Park, it's a fantastic project that we just completed, another RBA award-winning uh, scheme in Croydon, which is an amazing place to go and eat and drink and party. We've also just finished Oldham Town Hall, again, another RBA award-winning uh, project, uh, again, designed in Manchester. We also designed the Milan Expo Pavilion. We're just bidding to do another one for the next um, expo. Again, that probably won uh, nearly 20 awards. It was a fantastic project that we, that we all worked on. And that's me, that, that's the project I'm working on at the minute, which is a cancer centre in Liverpool. Um, I've been with the practice for about 20 years. Um, I had quite a humble beginning. I failed my A-levels miserably, ended up at Leicester Poly, um, did really well at a degree, worked in London for a while, went to Cambridge to do my postgrad, and then came to BDP. And the rest is kind of history. I know I don't look old enough for all of that. <laughs> but, but these are the, some of the buildings that I've, I've built in my kind of professional role as an architect in, in, in BDP. Um, but I guess the question is, you know, wh wh what is it that an architect does? I mean, I know there's probably maybe a few architects, but not many in the room. I thought it'd be worthwhile just kind of looking at that. Not in a massive amount of detail, because I'm kind of three minutes into my eight. But we work on, on kind of small and large scale projects. You know, the Hive is a pretty good example, something that we did in conjunction with um, Wolfgang Buttress, incredibly tal uh, talented art, uh, artist. But we also work on big city scale projects. So we, we, act, we designed and delivered Liverpool One from Manchester, which was you know, it's an amazing project that just transformed the city. But architects design buildings, that's kind of, that's our sort of big dream, that's what we do. Um, and there's a variety of different types of person that can be an architect. Um, because we've all, all, every architect needs to have a, a range of variety of different sort of skills from kind of practical to concept delivery to management of projects. And, and what we generally find is we, do, we have the rare kind of architect that kind of is good at everything. And um, you know, they generally kind of gravitate towards smaller practices, not always. We, we've got some pretty great all-rounders all as well. But the, there are architects that kind of gravitate more towards the creative side of the industry, which gives kind of opportunity for people who really don't want to get involved in the, in the technology. But we also have people who just want to build buildings, want, want to get involved in the kind of nuts and bolts of, of, of putting a building together. And, and both of those architect kind of typologies can, can definitely you know, need to work together to produce great projects. Now, the question is, so currently it takes seven years to get qualified, which is uh, you know, it's an immense sort of amount of time, particularly given the way that, you know, w when I qualified, um, there were grants, it was, you know, it was a kind of a funded sort of uh, prospect. It's not that anymore. But the question is, you know, why does it take seven years to, to, to get qualified? And, uh, and the reason, I, it's all kind of in this one kind of diagram. That, that's, what, that's the design process that, that we've kind of, put together that simply describes how easy it is to put a building together, starting at the beginning with a, a, with a client's brief and finishing at the end with a happy sort of 
clients and a great team. You know, plenty of twists and turns in between. An architect needs to be able to cope with those, to deal with change, to think about how people use the building socially, how the water is kept out of the building, how it, it works over time, how it can be developed over time and be flexible. It's a really complicated sort of activity. Um, and to do that properly, you need to take kind of an idea and a concept. This is all the hay, but we, we have this idea that it would be a hill in the park. So it's this idea about kind of rocks and grass that we created these kind of amazing CGI's and drew it in quite a lot of detail to make it kind of work. And on site, you know, what does an architect do? You know, where does this go? Well, go with the architect. So we, we take on this kind of role of developing a concept, which is that building there, which is built from the original kind of 3D model and turning it into a building, which is the same view from Springfield Park. And we do that by working in 3D, by using BIM in a really intelligent way, um, which gives an option for and an opportunity for people who want to get involved in the technology side of things, an opportunity to become an architect and to be part of our sort of design, design team. We've got a variety of different kind of routes into the profession. Th th these are guys that are, that are our architects in our office, and I did a quick kind of survey. And these are, these are the subjects that they kind of studied at A-level to go through the sort of traditional route. And you can see there's a variety of different sort of backgrounds, which really reflects the variety of different personalities that an architect kind of has or needs to have. But the typical process is, is, is long. The first degree uh, leads to a year of work experience, which leads to a second degree, which leads to another work experience year, and then you take professional exams and you find yourself being an architect. So it's part one, work experience, part two, work experience, and then a part three equals new architect. And that generally takes about seven years currently. But the professions realize that that really isn't an inclusive kind of progressive way of getting people into the profession. So things are changing. There's a new um, um, uh, apprenticeship sort of scheme that's coming in that we hope will arrive in 2019. There are 14 <laughs> practices in the country that are leading that charge and we're part of that. It's in the process of being designed and consulted on at the minute. But the way it's different is that um, it starts to, <coughs> to, to, to bring this kind of inclusive approach to getting architects into the profession as a leading kind of uh, ambition. So 20% of your time will be, will be spent away from an office doing professional kind of training. Uh, there are 14 practices offering that training. And that 20% of your study will be paid for by the apprenticeship levy, which we all contribute to. And we pay you 80% of the rest in salary. The difference is that the level six apprenticeship, which is paid, leads to a level seven apprenticeship, which again is paid, which means that you can then do your part one in four years, whilst you're getting, getting a salary, and you can do your part two and part three in four years, which means that you can be an architect in eight years. But during that process, you're, 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 you're earning, which I think is a very important sort of opportunity. Um, I hope I've kind of whetted your appetite about becoming an architect. And um, once you're qualified, that's where we're based. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, hi. Um, I've got notes as well. I'm going to have to look at them. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Again, I'm Sarah from Arty Trader, um, and I just wanted to kind of run through a little bit of the story of Arty Trader. It's not quite our colours, it's near enough. Um, so, how many of you in the audience own a car? Okay, good start. Um, how many of you bought that car or viewed that car through Arty Trader? Yeah, not as great. Okay, <laughs> so we need to work on our demographic to the younger audience. But other people have heard of us, hopefully. So, there's no words. Slight colour issue. 
Um, so that should say, once upon a time, about 40 years ago, there was a magazine called Arts Trader. And back in 1977, which is quite a long time ago, um, our first magazine was published. It was just in one region, just down Reading Way. But over that time, the magazine grew and became quickly a household name. And at our heyday, as a magazine, we had 30 regional magazines throughout the UK, in South Africa and Ireland. We employed 4,400 people across the different regions, and we had 55 offices. And it was very traditional. You'd take a picture of your car, you'd get in your car, and you'd take it down to an office, and someone would get it in the magazine for you. So we had lots of offices everywhere that people could get to, and it was very kind of personal get involved, have the conversations, and very manual process. And we had three factories printing those magazines. However, in June 2013, the last auto trader rolled off the press. So why and how are we still here? So back in 1996, we created our first website, two years before Google was even thought of. We just thought we'd get involved and give it a bit of a whirl and see what happened. And we quickly realized that we needed to invest more in this area. So we started investing massively in creating this digital marketplace where you as a consumer could come to find the vehicle you were looking for. But also, how could we support the dealers in the back? So how could we take their stock and put it in front of you easier so they didn't have to drive down? People weren't fighting to try and get into an auto trader van that were delivering the magazine so they could buy cars before anyone else had even seen it. How could we make that more easier for every party involved and how could we really transform this marketplace so we started to invest more and more in that area um, in 2007 we really started to go for it and we really started to implement our digital strategy in 2010 we relaunched the website our app our ipad application went live and we made the decision in 2013 to close a magazine that was still very profitable for us and the reason we made that decision, it was quite hard for a lot of our dealer customers, especially in some of our less car magazines like Truck, Plant and Farm, was we recognised we really needed to take hold of the industry and take them on the transformation and really utilise some of those online transactions to inform every party and become pretty much, if you'd imagine, like an online retailer. How can we value those positions that we can put in front of the customer? So from 2013, we really went for it. We changed the structure of the business. We moved away from having all those offices. And in 2014, we moved into two key offices. We opened our head office in Manchester. We made the decision to move head office from London up to Manchester. And we've got a small sub office in London. Um, and that's where we have our digital marketing brand PR teams. So we've got two sets of design. We've got our design team that supports us from a creative and brand point of view. And then in Manchester is where all our digital lives. So we've got designers within squads that support different areas, that support our different customers. So we've got the people that are supporting yourselves as consumers in the different areas of the website and support we can give to yourselves. And then people that are supporting our dealers. And we support the dealers right the way through, from getting the stock in front of you, to then managing them stocks, from pricing, buying decisions, and how they move the stock around the country. And then in 2017, we've taken it a step further. We want to be leading the way in everything we do, so we've pushed forward our next generation of design with a real focus on accessibility and inclusion. Everything we do at Alter Trader as well has been underpinned by our values, which came through in 2015. It wasn't really a culture change. We've always really had these at our heart, but we wanted to really bring them out and make sure that we were constantly checking back that everything we do is supported by these. And we made kind of a step further and really documented what diversity meant for us. And it was more around not just being the kind of things that kind of illegal contents come from, but more around social education, social deprivation, and also around neurodiversity too. So this is what we've been focusing on over the past couple of years. And we've seen a big improvement coming through. So we've seen a 2% increase in our female workforce in our digital teams. We've seen a 100% increase in our disabled workforce, and we're really trying to reach out and look for ways that we can support people in the neurodiversity community as well. 
So what we're looking to do for 2018 and beyond is where my role has come in. I've been with the business now. This is week seven. And our real focus is to ensure that we're feeding into the talent ecosystem in Greater Manchester. We recognise that the areas that we're trying to bring in and trying to ensure we've got the right skills and the right talent and the right mix of diversity, we can't just constantly keep fighting within the same talent pool. We need to invest back. So that's through investing in our employees and investing into our entry points. So we're really looking at how we can build the strategy around which roles within the business we can bring in, graduates, apprentices, look to retrain our workforce and look to retrain people that are looking for a career change. And I haven't put a cheeky slide on the end, it just says thank you. However, our graduate programme will be open for applications in November. Our degree apprenticeship programme will be open for applications in February. And we're constantly open to conversations with people that are interested in career changing. And we're looking at building out and replicating our apprenticeship programme into a trainee programme so people can still work towards getting qualifications in their chosen career change too. That's us. Okay, so I work freelance. I've been a freelancer for 24 years. So I don't work for one corporation or one company. I work for several. One of them has been ITV. Um, now, there was supposed to be someone from ITV to speak to you, but they were unable to make it, and so someone from ITV suggested that I come in, uh, even though I don't work for them. Uh, so... The slide is up here with some information about their website and their training, which I don't know a lot about, so I can't help you with that. <laughs> Apologies, but um, I've been asked to direct you to their website. Um, I can talk to you a little bit about, I mean, I've been involved in a mentorship program with Directors UK, Channel 4 and Hollyoaks, so I have been involved with mentoring and supporting and encouraging trying to get more female directors into the industry. Um, and there are different schemes around, um, and I can maybe share some of those while we're talking. Um, but really, you know, I left school when I was 16. I d did not get a tertiary education or a, a degree or anything like that. Um, so my experience is very different from everyone else on the panel. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I think Tess, that leads us beautifully into what I wanted to just maybe talk about for the first couple of minutes, which is um, we've, we've kind of heard, I guess, from the various organisations that everyone's representing today, but I, I'd be really interested just to hear um, a kind of quick synopsis of, I guess, how your own personal journeys and how you got into the roles you're now in, because um, I think certainly my experience is the creative industries and, and design not everybody knows at 16 that that's what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Some people do, and that's great, and they've got that pathway in, but um, I think it would be really useful just to share um, some, some of those experiences, and particularly from your side, Tessa, is, is not, it's not always about working for someone else as well, which is, um, is, is interesting. Can we start with you, Jane? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, so I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> I always hated, hated that question, still doing 40 now, so I should decide. Um, uh, so I went to, I did go to university and I went for subjects that I thought I would find interesting. Um, so I did history of art and English literature, which is absolutely useless for <laughs> any career in anything. Um, it did make me very good at arguing. Um, I was quite good to begin with, but now I'm extremely good at it. Um, I love arguing, it's my favourite thing. Um, <laughs> So uh, I did that. I uh, had a crisis of confidence uh, in my decision-making skills during my final year and thought, well, I don't want to follow a mop around McDonald's. So uh, I got a master's in computer science because I thought then I could get a job, uh, which turned out to be true. Um, so then I went on a trainee program and I went, I hate this. I don't want to do anything to do with computers. They're rubbish. Uh, and then I kind of dialed back from that. I went, no, I quite like computers, but I have opinions and I want to make them better. Um, so I got into usability research and uh, that's where I started. I did agency stuff as a, as a design researcher and uh, then I got into the BBC 
and then I stayed there for a really long time because I like it um, <laughs> and I've had lots of different jobs there. Brilliant, thank you. Claire. Thank you. Hiya, um, so my, um, I never, I still, I'm probably in the same patch as you, I still don't know what I want to do. Um, I left school probably before, just before I was 16 and I think it was a mutual can you leave, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm really honest. Um, didn't really get the whole academia thing. Um, loved art and like kind of woodwork and all that kind of thing, but it just didn't play to my strengths. I just couldn't get into it. Um, so for me, it was uh, I need to. I want to go and have fun, and I also so that means I need to work. Um, so started out in bar work, and then ended up thought that actually this is quite unsociable. So I can't go out with my pals when I want to. So I'm going to get an office job, which is nine to five, which means I can join them. That was my motivation at the time, obviously. Um, went into um, an office environment really and fell into HR. So it wasn't really something that I said I really wanted to do. And depending on what day you ask me, I'll probably tell you the same thing today. Um, but it, it definitely plays to my strengths, I think, is what I realised. And I've worked in lots of different sectors. So I started out in banking and financial services and then moved on to um, consulting. I have did a spell for a few years in a digital agency in the Northern Quarter um, and just did lots of different um, kind of roles and what I realized from doing that is actually I loved working in the digital agency and I loved working with people that were creative and collaborative and future thinking and you know I may not be the person that's thinking that far out in the horizon but I can help them get there and I can enable them to do it so I think that's kind of where I find that that's where I get my buzz from I love being around those types of people and um, so that's kind of me really um, still doing HR, probably still will be doing it in another 10 years, <laughs> probably still <laughs> saying I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> Brilliant. Ed, how do you get from Salford? Well, I guess I was kind of, I don't know if it's lucky or, or unlucky, but I knew in when I was kind of about 13 or 14 that I definitely, definitely wanted to be an architect. Um, I was really good at drawing, loved buildings, and it was just something I really got into quite early on. Um, and I went from there, um, school. Did, did that come from, was anybody in your family in that trade? No, did you understand what the job was? Not from, at all. You know, my, my dad worked in a foundry, my mum worked in a factory, you know, oh my, my sister was a teacher. Um, I don't really know where it came from. I, it was just a kind of a passion that just developed um, through books and kind of, you know, being in the city. I, d I, don't, I don't really know, but I just knew that I really wanted to be an architect. Maybe I didn't even know then what it actually meant. Um, so I went, to, went through school, did A-levels, didn't do brilliantly well. I uh, went through clearing, went to Leicester Polytechnic, which actually was a really good sort of technical school. It didn't, wasn't kind of an all-round school, which I guess is why the, the grade boundaries were a little bit low when I, I got in. Um, but I did really well. I got a first, um, worked in London on my year out for a big firm called Michael Orkit. Uh, came back um, uh, and... and, and um, did well in my kind of year out in this kind of seven year sort of odyssey. Uh, went to Cambridge University to do my postgrad diploma. Again, did really well. And then came into Manchester to work for uh, uh, Steve Hodder, Nicholas Grimshaw, and then eventually BDP. So I've been there, I've just worked out, it's, it's, it's going to be 20 years next year. It's a long time. Um, so when I grew up, I'm going to go traveling because <laughs> I didn't do that kind of that <laughs> bit in between. Yeah, yeah excellent. Brilliant, Sarah. Um, hi, so um, I, I left school at 15 as well. I was on August birthday, so it was legal. Um, <laughs> and I decided I wanted to go and work in an office, mainly because I had a really cool auntie who used to rob me paper and stationery from the office that she worked in. <laughs> um, and I thought that was the best thing ever in the world. I'd have as much paper and pens as I'd want. And it was true. Um, and also the idea of cash and being able to spend it was amazing. Um, I used to think I was very grown up. I had a suit and I used to get on the train to Manchester. I was like, check me out. <laughs> um, and really similar, I was really lucky. I was in very a general role within the office, you know, really important stuff like looking after the photocopier. And I had the opportunity, I was in a very um, fast paced growth organisation and they needed someone to go in and help them out with recruitment. And I was like, yes, I can go and do that. And the business, I started and I was number 165, and when I left, we were 4,500 strong. Um, and I had the privilege of working alongside one of the directors who was very passionate about investing back into the community. And one of the things, he, one of the ways he wanted to do that was by investing in young people and giving them access to the digital industry. So I worked very closely with the sixth form, with people that were neat, 
and it just sparked an absolute passion for me. Um, and just the, the speed of the growth of the organization and the speed of change within that technology industry was just like, this is amazing. Um, so I've stuck within the digital industry. I've moved from a few different organizations, but one of the things that I've always made sure of is the organization that I work for wants to invest back and has that entry route in. So now to have a role that's just around working with the business to see how we can bring new people in and getting to work with education and getting to work with, with people of you know all backgrounds and ages. It's not just a young people thing, but how can we get them started in this amazing industry? Um, so yeah, that's me. Uh, <coughs> okay, so uh, from the beginning, um, <laughs> my first job in the film industry, um, I was 17 and it was at a job centre. There was a, I used to go to the job centre every day looking for a job and there was a job there for a runner for a production company uh, and I got the job. Um, that production company made big budget uh, film commercials in New Zealand, huge you know, back then it was all film, this is in the 90s. So, um, you know, I was making the tea and running around and getting lunch and things like that. By the time I was 18, I had decided I wanted to be a director. It was very clear to me which job was the one I wanted. So I continued to work there, uh, and I also worked part-time in the weekends at a bar, and I saved up my money. I got a loan, two credit cards, and went to film school in New York and I made my first couple of films. And that was a revelation to me. I was 20, it was a real revelation to me. I knew exactly that that was what I wanted to do. I was able to be in a learning environment. Um, because everything was shot on film back then, it was very, very expensive to go and make a film. It's very different now, you guys are lucky. Um, so I went back to New Zealand feeling very hyped up um, and no one was interested. So then I just kept work, because I had worked in the industry for a couple of years, I knew people, so I was a production assistant, I was a clapper loader, I did locations, I just kept working in the industry, uh, continually writing and trying to make more short films. And I got to the point, I must have been about 24, when I realised that no one was really going to take me very seriously because I was doing all these other jobs, I only then, I decided then to only work in the industry if I was the writer or the director. So then I just went and got other jobs. I worked in a video store, I worked at a student job centre, helping students find jobs. But all the, all the time trying to write, trying to get funding to make films, make more films. And then my films started getting recognition and I got my first job paid as a director for my first television series when I was about 27. So it took a good, you know, nearly 10 years before I was actually paid to do the job that I wanted to do. I'd worked on that TV show for um, a couple of years, uh, and being in New Zealand, it was the only TV show they ever made over there, so I had no choice but to leave. <laughs> so I started looking at the credits for TV shows like Coronation Street, and there was Night and Day, and there was all sorts of other stuff, soaps mainly. Looked up people's email addresses, emailed them, and people wrote back, which surprised me. I got a one-way ticket, came to the UK, and within six weeks I was directing Hollyoaks. And I've never been out of work since, and I never got an agent. But being a freelancer, you are as good as your last job. So your reputation, your behaviour, means everything. Uh, I've worked on lots of other shows since then, but I still have very good relationships with ITV and with Hollyoaks and Channel 4. I work on those shows a lot. Those shows are ongoing, they, they never stop. So they're a really great way to keep on working, keep directing, and be able to go and do other things. I'm also a filmmaker, um, so I've made six short films, and my latest short film, my last short film I made last year, which is on the festival circuit and being developed into a feature. And uh, I also got to the point here in the UK where I thought there was a real ceiling, especially for female directors, and I ended up investing in myself, to try the US market, and I've just done, finished my first show over there. You just don't stop. <laughs> it's constant. You don't stop. And it's hard work. Uh, you, like I said, you have to maintain your reputation and work 
the best that you can on every job you do, whether you enjoy it or not, or whether you like the people you're working for or not. It's constantly keeping at that level all the time. So, um, I, I thought we've talked a lot today about the kind of, I guess, the breadth of what Creative and Digital Industries is, and it and it's broad and getting broader. Within each of those areas, there's a whole um, ever-evolving list of roles, from UX designers to researchers to graphic designers to coders, and so so. Um, I think as an industry, it is constantly changing. We hear also a lot about the threat of technology and the robots are going to take our jobs and we're all going to be left you know, um, doing the menial tasks or whatever that might be. So I'm really interested to hear from everybody on um, what, what within your own different spheres and sectors are the things that you think will disappear as uh, jobs and skills and what do you think is going to always be needed? And, and I guess for, for everybody here today, that begins to inform the kind of skills that people really need to focus on. Jane, you talked a little bit about this at the beginning, that in a sense the languages we might work on in technology might change, but actually what, what, are, the, what are the important bits? So, so um, I guess to be specific about the question, what, what, do we, what roles do we think are going to disappear? What roles do we think are here to stay? Um, and maybe, maybe work, work down the line again if that's all right, Tim. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. I'll get in trouble. University of Salford, <laughs> I'll have my art. Um, so uh, what jobs do I think are going to disappear and what things do I... Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's going to disappear. Uh, every time I think, oh, that's done, it turns up again a wee while later <laughs> as something slightly <laughs> different but actually requiring all the same skills. So, uh, for example... Uh, when I first started at an advertising agency in London, there were all these partnerships between copywriters and graphic designers, yeah. and that was the sort of traditional creative partnership. And that all kind of went away, and we all went, no, we're all digital designers, and we've got to do all of it, and it's one job now. And, uh, and then conversational UIs have broken through, and we're all like, oh, shit, we need some writers, <laughs> and we don't really have them anymore. So I, I sort of think... I don't think you can. Uh, I don't think you can really realistically predict um, yeah. what might go away. I think what what does happen is things change. So, um, user research when I started doing it was traditionally uh, someone sitting in a lab that was made up to look like uh, look like a like a sort of living room with some cheap IKEA furniture, <laughs> and some other people sitting next door either with like a camera or a two way mirror like in True Lies. And um, you know, you'd, you'd sit and freak out some participants that you'd paid that they would get freaked out, and that was the way that you did user research to discover if something was usable. And um, that is increasingly being replaced by kind of more automatic processes. So you can do it with an, you can do it with multivariate testing. You can do it with analytics and just expose that design to a tiny number of people, um, which you know gives you enough statistical significance to go that direction, not that one. So I don't know if you all remember this, but there was sort of four or five years ago, a very disconsolate um, person from a uh, designer from, I think, face, uh, no, Google going on. It was, it was the sort of 27 shades of blue person who complained that they would just put up loads of designs and that's how they decided. And the craft was gone and it wasn't about design anymore because MVT was going to take it over. What a load of bollocks. That's obviously not true either. There's still designs and there's still someone deciding at the back of that what you test and what the strategy is. Mm -hmm. That's still a creative job. So it just changes. That's all. Yeah. Brilliant. Claire. Um, so for me, I'm always reading about this kind of thing and trying to look further out, but I struggle because it's moving at such a pace. Um, from what I kind of know and kind of understand, it's the roles, if you think specifically around the co-op, given that we have a lot of stores, it's going to be individuals that are working in those stores and in depots that are probably going to be most worried at the moment and what's coming, um, because it is that repetitive type role and that, that those roles that, you know, you, that are quite easy to predict, um, I think we need to look at. And that from our different co-ops angle, we're looking at then how do we make sure that we can retrain these individuals and give different career opportunities. Um, and I think that's our responsibility as a large employer to be able to do that. Um, yeah, it's it's really hard to be able to kind of figure out what, what is kind of coming down the track. And for me, also, I, we talk about automation and we think robots, but it's not so much about robots, it's about software. 
So if you think about uh, some of those repetitive tasks, HR will be impacted by that in the future. Legal professions, those working in kind of in, in tax are going to be there's, there's the software is going to be clever enough to be able to actually replace some of those roles or mean that the, the teams are smaller. Um, so I think it's it's a kind of an, always a moving feast, and I think it's one to keep watching and, and to keep kind of just set your Google alerts up and read everything that's coming through because that's generally what I do. From an, from an architect's viewpoint, it's, it's a similar kind of um, I think it's a similar kind of outcome. Um, you know, I think when I when I was at university, there was one computer in the building. And people used to just come and kind of look at it, and kind of wonder what wonder what it was for. Obviously, that was a long time ago. But 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 now, um, uh, technology and building things things in in virtual reality and in three D is is kind of happening now. Um, you know, we, we now have to design buildings to a level it's called two D. It's basically every single kind of building needs to have a a sort of a BIM a three D model with it when we hand it over to the client. And the advantage that brings is that the, the kind of boring stuff that an architect used to do, like scheduling windows, scheduling doors, doing really kind of monotonous, horrible stuff that you know new graduates would be, be asked to do, is now completely automated. It comes out of a model, as long as the model is built properly. Um, and, and that gives us a massive advantage. One, in, in, in that all the boring stuff is kind of it's done automatically, which is great. Two, it, it gives you guys an opportunity to do the really interesting stuff as soon as you graduate and as soon as you're into the profession. And we, we look to the new graduates who really are technologically kind of savvy to learn how to model and how to do things in a slightly kind of different way. You know, we're using uh, virtual reality on a regular basis now. I present regularly to clients, to end user groups, using Samsung gear and sort of, you know, different kind of digital technologies which means that clients can see a space before we even get anywhere near building it, which means co coordinating it in terms of the structure and the services, again, is, is more simple. And what that means is it gives, gives, gives us as architects more time to do the things that we're good at and that we, that, that we get most pleasure out of. So if anything, technology is, is making the profession a much more attractive sort of proposition, I think. Thank you. Um, my kind of view of how things have changed and how they seem to be continuing to change is the roles that are going to disappear are managers. And that may seem like a really silly statement, but the, the automation that's coming through and all this technology that's supporting us are removing the transactional elements of roles, which means organisations are becoming leaner, which means we need less people managers. So this assistant manager, manager, head of department reporting into operational director, strategic director, everything's becoming flatter, which means as individuals we need to grow our experiences out. Because those transaction elements that don't require as much manpower are fading away. The things that, from the HR point of view, we, it's, it's disappearing. People, managers are becoming self-sufficient because the information's there, they can find it themselves. So I think there's going to be less and less layers, so as individuals and preparing for your future, I'd suggest just thinking about how experiences and how you broaden that out. Because I think there's still this mindset of you need to get that promotion, you need to get that promotion, you need to be working your way up. And organisations are not being able to offer that anymore. So, uh, managers, don't tell mine. <laughs> <laughs> not personal. Um, well, my industry has changed a huge amount technically. From when I started, everything was still on film. And now, of course, you can shoot a feature film on your phone. So those sorts of things are, are different. And it's much more accessible to people now. You can go and make something, and it's relatively cheap compared to what it used to be. Um, so that's changed. And Netflix and Amazon have uh, revolutionised the TV industry. So I'd imagine that BBC and ITV are a little bit frightened about that. I mean, it's, they're taking a huge audience away from, um, well, they are. And, and having just been in the United States, the amount of work over there, it's incredible. There's so much work there. The industry is flooded. There's almost, it's, it, it's going to crash at some point. I'm hoping to take advantage of it as much as I can. <laughs> but um, there is, there's a lot of work.
Um, the film industry is slightly different. There's a lot of big budget films and small budget films, but not a hell of a lot in, in the middle. Um, but, you know, uh, for me personally, um, I've had to do recently, I'm 43 now, I've had to do, I've had to go and make a short film, pay for it myself, um, to try and get to, you know, to try and uh, get a little bit more recognition to show something else, some other part, other skills. Um, and it, it, it certainly helped me get my uh, job in America. So I've had to do the same thing that I had to do when I was 19. And I had to tell a story that affected people and people were interested in. That hasn't changed. So um, it was still expensive. <laughs> But um, but st but I still it was just me a sound recordist and a cameraman went up to Scotland for a weekend made a film so you know your stories are important human stories and connecting and that's what people want to watch and that has not changed that's exactly the same so I'm I'm going to change tacks a little bit for um, a few minutes now and talk about um, diversity we, we had a great event on Monday night which. Um, our, es our essay question was, can the creative industries ever be truly, truly diverse? And, and I guess our inspiration point for that was, um, with Magnetic Northwood, the company that I work for, just finished a project with the British Film Institute, and uh, that took 100 years worth of British film, every British film ever made, into an archive, and we designed that to make that accessible so that journalists and members of the public and everybody could look at that data, which is fascinating, and goes at a really granular level through what kind of characters are represented in a movie, who makes that, who's front of camera, who's back of camera, all that stuff. One of the things that I think they expected to come out, but perhaps not in quite as grim a picture as, as, it, as it did come out, was around gender diversity, and that actually in 100 years, the film industry in this country has moved backwards, not forwards, and still a minuscule um, amount of, um, of film output um, involves women, unless you want to play a prostitute or work with so, uh, and actually, w when, when you kind of turn that across all of the creative industries, the, the picture isn't much brighter. You know, we've got a real um, diversity issue. And we, we invited Andy Byrne and, and Great Manchester Mayor to come and talk about and, and open the event for us. And, and his big kind of theme was around, uh, actually, um, for a lot of the creative industries, is still the domain of white, middle class, How do we change that situation? And Manchester's opportunity, and we're all uh, based here or headquartered here or have got a big presence here as organisations and, and therefore got, you know, vested interest. Manchester potentially, you know, uh, could uh, break that mould and help um, reach out and find, as an industry, we're interested in getting the best talent, you know, and, and we all want to find that whatever quarter and whatever background and um, whatever that looks like. And so, so I'm interested really to explore... I guess, um, people's personal thoughts on that, and then for the organisations that you're representing, or not representing, um, what what are you doing about that? How are you approaching that? Let's, we'll start. Am I going again? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a Virgo. It's, it's got to be logical. We all go left to right. I'm Chloe. Okay, so the whole question is, I've got to do... Um, what are my personal experience or yeah, opinions or are? personal opinions and then yeah. and those of your organisation. All right. Um, so... I think working in user experience is a weird area to be in because design uh, feels traditionally more sort of female coded than most than a lot of other industries, um, but it's the digital end, and for some reason that seems to kind of uh, drive more women away than it should do early doors. So, um, and so uh, when I when I first worked in uh, the BBC down south in in London. Um, the team was probably about 50-50. And then um, we had some interesting uh, things happen, an interesting boss or two, and the, and the gender balance changed and it got a bit more male. And then I moved up here and started building the team here. When I first moved up to uh, Manchester about seven years ago, um, I was working the Oxford Road building in a team of four designers. It's now 75. So it's, it's, been, it's been an interesting thing to watch. When we first got here, the digital industry in the north was not 
the burgeoning thing it is now. It was really hard to find people in UX, very hard indeed. And uh, we were finding the applications we got were hugely more male than female. Like we ended up with this thing that we dubbed the Salford Lads Club in our team <laughs> because we couldn't we couldn't get the women through the door, and it was really distressing. Um, you know, speaking as a female manager, it was horrifying. I felt like I was uh, betraying my people. Um, but uh, I think, uh, so So there's things that we can do about that. There's out obviously, um, there's basics around outreach uh, and because it's at school age that I think the choices are being made and people are sort of moving themselves away from kind of more STEM flavored um, sort of end of the profession, design profession. There's also just uh, kind of allowing people to understand that the door is open, you don't need a degree in something really specific and really digital to get a digital job. And actually, um, the, you know, just to, just to be really clear, it's obvious why we need to do this. Like, if you're, if you're a designer, your job is to uh, create empathy. You can't, you know, the, the way that you create that is by having as diverse a group of people as possible. If everyone in the room is a white 24-year-old male, they'll design something that works really well for a white 24-year-old male. They won't be able to help themselves. Um, so it, you have to have people who aren't like that in the room or you don't get the sort of products that you need. And we've got public purpose. You know, the good thing about working at the BBC is we are genuinely for the public good. There's no kind of commercial paymaster at the back of it. So um, we, we, have to we have to represent the diversity of the UK in our team. So if we're not doing it, it's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. So where we are now is um, our team's about 40, 60, which is better than it was. Um, but more importantly still, when that whole gender pay gap thing happened in the BBC, UX was like, <laughs> we've sorted ourselves out because we've actually been monitoring it for uh, three or four years on our team. And uh, when we come to the time of year when we do pay review, uh, we do it uh, statistically. So we look at groups of people at level of seniority um, and uh, work out who's, who's, being, who's out of that group and, and basically average it back up so that everyone's in a sort of, in a similar band. And it means that we can look at the sort of, um, and then we can go and look at it and go, right, gender wise, who's getting paid more, who's getting paid less. And we're in three, uh, we're in 2.5% on every pay grade. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's how close together they are. And in some cases, the women are getting, the women are on average getting paid more than the men. So uh, that's just by looking at it that way awareness is huge so if you just have those numbers it starts changing your mind and you start seeing things there's also just like i mean you can do person to person stuff so on average men are more likely to apply for a job if they've got about 60 percent of what it says on the job application okay. women will aim for about 90 percent or 100 percent. so women in the room don't do that just apply when you're not ready yet <laughs> that's what the men do that's the first thing I would say. The other thing is um, that uh, women are less likely to ask for a pay increase. So don't do that either. Um, if hopefully, if you're working in a place like the BBC, then we're doing it this way. In the background, we're looking at the data in the round. We're not going, oh, such and such blokey McBloke faces asked for some money, so we'll definitely sort that one out. And uh, little miss, I'm very nice, hasn't asked for anything, so we won't bother with her. Like, hopefully you're working for an employer that's thinking about that stuff in the round. Um, but you won't be all the time. And it's quite hard to be that organized, you know, so people do these things by accident. They're not being bastards, they're just doing it by accident. Sometimes they're being bastards. Sometimes they're being <laughs> bastards, but no, <laughs> I do, I, I, you know, well, I generally favour cock up over conspiracy with these things. I think people are less likely to be competent than, than we want them to be. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of that going on as well. Um, but the other thing we can do is, like, if we're talking about it regularly, it changes things. Um, there's things that we can control and that do seem fair. Um, so one of the things we do is... Um, we gender balance every employment panel, uh, like every interview panel that we can. Um, sometimes it's over the round, so you'll have pairs of women and pairs of men, but we try not to do that. We try and have one of each on, on interview panels. Um, we also um, are working to anonymize more and more of the applications, so we're not seeing names and stuff. That's slightly tr problematic as well. When we've experimented with that, we found that you end up letting more men in because of the problem with the, I've done 60% of this, I'm totally ready, I'm super confident. So um, 
we've also rewritten a lot of our job descriptions because we were kind of concerned that our language was coding quite masculine. There was a point where it's like, we're looking for thrusting young people who've got super, who are very, going to put themselves forward in a very, you know, meaty and war-related way. I'm joking. It wasn't quite that bad. But there's, you know, like, it, there was language that was sounding more machismo than was necessary. So we changed a lot of that language. And I think that we, we think that had a change in the applications we were getting. Interesting. Kai, I know, I know you've obviously, you're as an organisation, very focused on digital. Mm. And I know you've done some work specifically around um, female engineers, which yes. is a particular yes. challenge. Yeah. So um, very similar to some of the things that you've touched on, um, we have, it's not me that's coding back there, is it? <laughs> um, so we've, we, we're two years into the, the co-op digital team and I joined just over about a year ago and you could clearly see in our resourcing we were struggling to get the right candidates and applicants through the door. But equally what we were finding in engineering specifically um, and also within data and analytics, it's very male dominated. So we kind of took a step back, looked at our resourcing practices and said, "How? what are we doing that is firstly not attracting the, you know, women to apply for these jobs? And then what's that process all the way through to actually make sure that the, the process itself isn't biased? Um, so we've done similar things, used a, a software tool called Textio, which literally just neutralizes the adverts so we don't have anything that may be, that would attract more of male than female, that type of thing. Um, and we have the balanced, kind of the gender balanced interview panels as well, so we always make sure that we do that. And we've gone back and had a look at it just seven or eight months later, and we realized that actually we've shifted the balance within kind of male-female in engineering alone. So it is round about that kind of 60, um, 40 as well. Um, that it's, it's made us start thinking, what else can we do, Phil? So we're looking over at data, and obviously that's a huge investment area for us. That's very male-dominated, so we're going to apply the same things that we've learned from that space and, and make sure that we, we do it, and we talk to our candidates, and we find out what went well. Even if they weren't successful, what went well, what didn't, what, you know, how could we have done that differently? Um, other things that we've kind of done with our hiring managers um, is done that kind of unconscious bias training. So being aware of your own biases helps. It doesn't solve it, but at least then you're aware of it. So that when you're sitting and you're in that position where you're making a selection, that doesn't kick in maybe as hard as it could do. Um, or you notice when it does, yeah. So it's having the tools then to go, okay, yep, my bias is this. I can't let that, you know, influence my decision. So we have we, we have a lot of kind of support around that as well to make sure that the sifting of CVs and the selection, there's somebody there challenging and really kind of asking those questions. So that's been a really good learning and actually it's been good to be able to go back and say, actually has it made any difference? And then therefore, how do we make sure that we can roll that type of practice out across the rest of the co-ops and not just within co-op digital, so we're learning from that, which is really good. Um, I've been in HR for quite a while, and d and and diversity and inclusion always seem to be about that kind of, those protective characteristics. And it feels like now people are starting to realize that it's not just about that list. It's actually about the, this, just that difference in thought and that different backgrounds to make sure that when we are looking at the products and solutions for our customers and members, we're really reflective of our community. So. I don't know if anybody's aware, but we ha we actually um, own academies, so we own schools. We've got about ten now um, across Greater Manchester and also within Leeds, and they are, tend to be in places where actually it, it, there, there's not a lot of uh, kind of money around. There maybe the kids aren't potentially coming from families where actually they're they're, they're maybe they're working parents, and they're not the aspiration I guess potentially isn't there. So we're doing a lot of work with our academies, really starting there with a the view that we can go out into schools further beyond that. And we've partnered up with WISE um, on kind of some STEM diagnostics to kind of understand where are we good, where are we bad, where do we need to improve. We've got a lot of our uh, really good leaders, female and male um, role models, going into the academies and talking about the creative industry and what the different types of roles that are there. And we've got a work experience scheme as well, so that in the, the pupils that are interested can come in and actually do some work experience as well. And then the route could be then into the apprenticeships. Um, so there's, it's starting early, I think, is where we need to be. We're not quite there yet. We've got lots more to do um, because I think we need to go back to that kind of Gen Z and start there, really, and start working with those kind of nine-year-olds and up to actually start forming what, what, what are the potential career options there for you and helping them start thinking differently. And it sounds weird when you think about talking to a nine-year-old, mm -hmm. but 
My nine-year-old niece is, keeps talking about lots of different jobs. She wants to be a YouTuber, apparently, latest. But <laughs> they are kind of thinking. They're looking to, to around them as well to understand what are the options and what are other people doing. And if they can't see that in front of them and see it, you know, the really good reflection, then they're not going to consider it. Jay, how, how is it in our... T I saw some woeful statistics around architecture. Uh, equally woeful mm. as, as, as many of the design um, industries. But... Um, and a particular problem, which again is is a kind of theme across the industry, is it seems to get worse as you get higher up the tree. So, so you get reasonable uh, kind of gender representation at entry level, but that moves up. Why, why do you think that is, and how, how's BDP helping to address that? Well, um, I'm feeling a bit under pressure here in this company <laughs> as a as a white middle-aged Oxbridge graduate. Um, well, at least I'm from Salford. I mean, I don't know that it kind counterbalances of the whole thing. It's fine. We, 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 we absolutely don't have a positive discrimination policy when, when it comes to recruitment. It's all about the quality of the candidate. And so we looked at statistically kind of where we, where we sat across all the profession, across all the practice. We employ about 950 people. Um, and uh, recruitment and the pro at the professional level of our firm, we're at near enough 50-50 as a male-female split, which is a pretty pretty good position to be in um, and that's across all the professions not, not, not just architecture but I think we have recognized and it, and it is a kind of an industry-wide sort of issue that as you move up the, 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 the sort of hierarchy of the firm architect professional director company director there is a kind of a diminishing sort of proportion um, and we've kind of accepted it and we um, are doing positive things about it like introducing you know looking to introduce more flexible kind of working, job sharing, you know, part-time working, um, to try and kind of address that, that, that sort of, those statistics and really kind of take the problem on, you know, fr front on. Because obviously we, we want to keep as many of our talented um, sort of females coming through the firm to, to strengthen kind of you know, the, 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 the environment and, and strengthen the work that, that, we, that we do. But it is a, a cross-profession sort of issue. Um, and I think it comes back to this, this sort of idea about women being reticent, about being confident about their abilities, about you know, only ticking, you know, wanting to tick 90% of, the, of the, the sort of job description before they even think about um, uh, you know, applying for, for roles. In our, in our firm, and I think in the profession generally, um, People only get the, the, the sort of the, the name of the role or the, pro or the you know the promotion title once they're actually doing the job, and it's all about and it, you know, all, all the kind of you know the ladies in the in the audience. I really encourage you to think about this. You need to really take responsibility before it's given to you, and and you know I, I think that's something else that we're we're trying to sort of encourage and develop and and sort of train within our our, our organisation, and that's something I encourage you know the whole profession sort of takes on a, as an issue you know the, 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 the sort of you know the, the, the sort of driven you know mid-20 kind of male guys in our office i know just want to take responsibility and just keep on keep on taking it until they can't take any more and that i think that reflects in kind of you know how how, how, how the male and female split progresses through um the, the, you know, the ranks in, in, our, in our firm but it's something that we we absolutely need need to correct um, and it's something that we're, we're, we're working really hard to do. From, from the other sort of inclusive, sort of diverse sort of um, issue dealing with that, um, we have somewhere anywhere between 12 and 20 um, sort of week-long placements in our office. And I absolutely kind of monitor that so that we have a good representation of all the, the, the sort of boroughs of, the, of, of Greater Manchester represented within the students that come to us, so they're from, some are from grammar schools, some are from comprehensive, some are from academies, you know, hopefully some, some co-op academies, to really try and get a kind of a broad mix of people knowing what architecture and the profession is about from a really early age, ma male and female. We have primary school classes coming in, I give them sort of you know, a talk about, well actually I introduce it, our younger guys explain what being an architect is all about. Because again, it's trying to encourage people at that kind of really young age, male and female, that the, you know, the, 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 the sort of the opportunities there for, for everybody 
to, to, to get involved in producing you know, great, great buildings. And hopefully this new apprentice sort of approach will again you know, widen the field in terms of getting people um, from a variety of different backgrounds into the profession and, and, and working successfully in, in the city. Sarah, you talked quite passionately about, um, you know, obviously there's more to diversity than just gender, it's particularly kind of hot topic at the moment in our industry, but um, I think also the kind of postcode, uh, you know, diversity, it'd be, it'd be great to understand more about that and, and in particular also traders work around that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, it'd be good to talk about that because if you throw in digital and automotive, that's a that's not attractive uh, to <laughs> the female population. Although we do work really hard on it and we've tried to change that, pe pre that preconception. So our stats are coming up. But yeah, a real passion for me is around that reach out to people from different communities. People who maybe have not got that role model in digital are here so often, especially from apprentices and graduates that come through, that their chosen career path has come from an inspirational person, either that be a parent, a brother or sister, someone that they've met. And you know, you still got that percentage of people that have come across it because that passion and interest. But how many people are we missing that have just not met that role model yet, that that touch point? Um, and I've been one of the things I'm trying to set up for Auto Trader is um, that we become a careers and enterprise advisory employer, so we get matched with a skill. One of the big things that they're pushing is they've done a lot of research and they've suggested that if a student doesn't have four meaningful touch points with people in employment or in an industry or a role model, if they don't have that and they've naturally maybe not got a parent in work or, or an inspirational family member or just in that industry, they're eight to seven percent more likely to become neat. So personally, God knows how I'm where I am because there wasn't that inspirational person. I think it was pure fluke, the need to want to buy more shoes. And uh, the fact that somehow I fell into an organization where I met that inspirational person, that person who'd set the business up, who kind of made me think, do you know what, I can go after this. And although I did leave school at 15, I've worked my bum off to get, make sure my qualifications are there too. So I've got that through, but how can we get that out to other people? So we're looking to be matched with skills that have got a higher percentage of um, children that have get free meals that have got a wide range of diverse backgrounds so we can really introduce the digital and creative world into them. The best people that can do that are the people in the roles. Um, so we're encouraging people from the company to go out there and talk about it. We, we're putting forward, we've got um, a giving something back, a make a difference project and the things we're pushing out is, you know, how can you get out there? There's lots of different mentoring programs where you can go out there and speak to people. But the next thing that we're gonna start looking at is how do we reach people who've maybe ended up in a career that's not for them? or they've ended up in a long-term unemployment situation, maybe they've been a carer, how do we inspire them to maybe go for a career change? And I think the apprenticeship opportunity is amazing. Because um, I think, you know, you may go down one path and it, you change your mind. Um, so a few things we've done previously is changing the, the need to have a particular degree to go into a particular graduate programme. Um, and then there's always been the restrictions in the past. So you can't do an apprenticeship because you've got a degree. Well, now you can do whatever you want. So if you've done a degree and you think, do you know what, I'm struggling to get into that industry and I found out about this, you can go and do the apprenticeship route or you can do a level seven and do a postgrad apprenticeship in a different discipline. Um, so there's lots of different options um, of how we can hopefully reach out, but that's where we're hopefully trying to make a difference because if we continue to fish in the same pot of talent, there's only so many women in digital, there's only so many people from different backgrounds um, from different, you know, uh, anything. And if we all keep fighting after that, we're just going to create this, probably nice for the people that are in it, but excessively paid group of people yeah. that are not very well-rounded. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring more people in. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're, we're aiming to do. Tasha, you, you, you exist in an extraordinarily male-dominated <laughs> universe. I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> Where I'm not sure if you can imagine, <laughs> but if you could, <laughs> what it would be like for a woman from the age of 17 to the age of 43 in the film and television industry working freelance. So the differences between working with someone like ITV or BBC, where you have an HR department, you have people that you can go and talk to that can support you, that can help you in your career development, that can guide you, those are really, really important things. 
when you're freelance, you don't have anything like that. You're on your own. You are on your own. So you can't really go anywhere and complain because you're probably not going to work there again. There are also I have a lot of war stories, and um, they're not particularly positive. Uh, so the desire, I think, to do my job has to go above and beyond all of that rubbish. So I think you have to have very thick skin. I probably have made my life very difficult in the way that I've done things. Um, but you know, for, for example, I've done a series where I'm paid less than the male directors, even though I'm doing exactly the same job. And these are organisations in this country who are highly thought of. Um, I have been told, don't tell anybody you've got children. I, I'm a single mother. So I've been told, make sure you don't tell anyone you've got a child. Um, there are all sorts of things, and that's, these are recent things, these are in the last five years. There are all sorts of stuff. They're saying that it's changing, um, and there are certainly some things in the media, we, you know, like the BFI have now got 50-50 um, gender uh, balance with filmmaking and production, uh, feature films and female writers and directors, which is great. Um, but I am known as a female director. I'm not known as a director. So I've uh, gone to shows where they've said, oh, we've already got a female director. We don't need another one. So if there are quotas, if their quota has been ticked, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're open to have any more. There are a whole lot of issues with this. I could go on and on about it. <laughs> but when you do work for organisations, like I said, like BBC and ITV, you're not going to face that as much. You know, and also, you know, I've come through a period with the, the 90s and up till now where it's um, been particularly difficult. But then, I, you know, I, I was, saw my mother the other week and we were speaking about this, about all the Weinstein stuff that's yeah, been going yeah. on. Um, and, you know, it was very, very difficult for her as well. I think um, hopefully times are changing. And what advice would you give if, if there are young women in the audience who are thinking, you know, this is what I want to do in my life, are the things you would do differently, things you would change, how, how, what advice would you give? I have no course? regrets. I have absolutely no regrets. Um, there's nothing that I would do differently. I think that what I didn't know when I was, you know, in my 20s making films is that I'm a much better filmmaker now. I'm a much better director as I've got older. I thought I was good then, but really I wasn't. And I think that to try and embrace the fact that as you get older and the more experiences that you have and the more people that you deal with and whether you're working for nothing or you're making a film that's not making any money or you're doing, you're working freelance as a boom operator or whatever to get to the goal that you want, all of these experiences are going to make you become a better at what it is that you want to do. So to embrace everything. So we're going we're gonna to go to questions from the audience in a minute, but before we do, can we just, I guess, continue that theme, what about down the line, in terms of advice to, you know, uh, the people that we've got here today who might be looking to start out on a, on a career in the creative industry. We're going to go, uh, I'm going to twitch for a bit, but we'll go backwards down the line. So what was, what was the question? So just, I guess, general advice, 60 seconds, for anybody who's thinking about embarking on a career in um, some aspect of the creative or design industry. Um, being nice, being a good person, being helpful, um, that's what gets noticed. I mean, I work with a lot of young people that come in, I've mentored people from runners to camera assistants to whatever. If you are nice and polite and you work hard and you, your work ethic is strong and um, you will get more work. If people, that's a big part of our industry as well, is that um, is your own personal behaviour, how you behave on set, how you deal with other people, how you communicate. They are huge, hugely important aspects and values that we appreciate. Um, mine's just collect as much experience as you can and recognise it as experience. If you've got a part-time job while you're studying, all those skills that you're building up are extremely transferable, especially if you're in a customer-facing role. We love that. So you know, don't ever hide any experience either way. Collect it all. Um, 
think about how you can bring them all together. The greatest day for me will be when CVs die because I, I don't think there's a correct <laughs> way to write them. I don't think there's a correct way what to put on them. For me, the world of portfolio needs to come together. Um, there's rumours of like a digital passport that you might get that you can collect things in. But just being able to, to have a look at someone's work and look at their experiences adds so much more value. So think about how you can collect things as you go through to really showcase yourself. And I don't mean like record of achievement stuff. I mean like real stuff that you've done. Um, but be proud of everything that you have done because every experience that you get will add so much value to your next move and just think about how you can grow that out. Apart from working really hard, which I think everybody <laughs> would kind of agree on, on that, I'd kind of disagree with the, the CV bit. For an architect, it's, it's kind of slightly different. That's the first, your first kind of knock on any practices door is your CV. And if it's not a four, a two, A4, four side, beautiful piece of graphic design, it goes in the wrong pile. So that's something you really need to work hard at. You need to try and get as much work experience as you can. And again, that's, that's not always as easy as it, as it, as it is easy to say. But the third thing I'd say, and hopefully kind of all these guys will share this kind of approach, is you need to start thinking about networking like now. So you need to go to events, to exhibitions, to, to everything, to meet people like these guys kind of, you know, who kind of, you know, go to, go to events and plan a kind of a strategy to try and kind of, you know, expose yourself to the profession before you're at the stage of needing to get a job in it. So I would have said all what those guys said. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't repeat um, that. But I think the experience bit is really important. And I think taking yourself out of your comfort zone and doing some new things as well as learning, I just think it will just create that, um, that kind of leadership skills that you're actually going to need. Um, what you tend to find in the creative kind of sector, not as a general rule, and that I wouldn't say that, is that we can, we can easily find people that are really smart and have the skills that we want. But in terms of leading teams and thinking around strategy and future thinking, that makes you more rounded as, as a good candidate. So anything that you can do, even if it's not paid, but just that kind of allows you to own something, to work with people and lead people and and just coordinate and just get people the best out of folks, I think is the, probably would be my best advice to just do more of that. All that, <laughs> plus. Um, so uh, I really agree with the be nice thing, but I think uh, talking about that in the face of, sorry, I'm, I'm on a bit of a feminist kick because of the, uh, the things with the internet and Weinstein and things. Anyway. Um, so I think one thing that helps, like you might experience situations where you feel like some prejudice is at play and that's everyone in the room. We're all marginalized at different times for different reasons, either because we're too young, we're too old, we're the wrong color, we're the wrong sex, we're whatever. There's all sorts of reasons why someone might uh, do bad things. And in all of those, I think allies help, you know, and you can be part of a story so you can help by saying something even if it's a small thing, it doesn't seem that important and you want to, you want to seek to make it smaller because it was bad. Um, allies help with that. And also, don't be a ladder kicker. At some point in the future, you might have managed to get up a ladder. Don't kick it away. You know, there's always someone who's worse off than you coming up behind. I've got a lovely middle-class background. I went to university. I had a great time, you know. Um, so, yes, I've experienced sexism in my career, which has been a problem. But the fact is there's people that came from a shittier postcode than I. And there's people who've come from different backgrounds and they don't have the advantages I do. So, um, for me, I work in an organisation that has an oversupply of talented people that want to come and work for us, which is fantastic. Great news. Um, but it means that all of those... Um, uh, all of those unconscious biases, it's easy for those to come into play because we've got lots of good CVs. So we've got to fight very hard to stop that from being the way that people come in. Or, you know, Media City UK ends up looking like a colonial hill station full of middle class white people. So, you know, we've got to do what we can. Um, have we done enough? Probably not. Uh, we have to keep working, we have to keep iterating and improving what we do. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. So much. Come on.
<laughs> I, I still exist in a world where people think Lou is a man and I'm his PA and I've just come to kind of warm the chair until Lou arrives, you know. So, yeah, it, it goes on yeah. in abundance. And uh, and it is more, I think, it's, you tend to be stuck in your own kind of uh, experiences, don't you? you know? so, it's, so if you're a woman in tech, you've experienced a lot of gender prejudice. Uh, I think it gets actually more highlighted as you have a daughter, which I now have, which you suddenly go, actually, I'd quite like the world of work to be a lot better by the time you're in it. And, uh, you know, my, my other life is um, as I, I help to run an organisation called Albright, which is its whole purpose is to make the UK the best place in the world to be a female entrepreneur. Currently, it's one of the worst. And actually, of all venture capital in the UK, women get le female founder businesses get less than 3%, which is astonishing. So, so it's everywhere in every walk of life. I think there's a bit of me used to go, I'll just step over it. Now I've kind of moved more into the confront it camp. And I think, I think the best thing we can do is to just normalize our environments and get, even if you have to push quite hard, so that in 10 years time, that level of diversity in all kinds that we'd like to see is represented. I, I passionately believe if there's any city who's going to do that. Manchester is the best place. You know, we, we absolutely champion those values. We gave birth to the Pank Curse. You know, if, if there's any city that I would like to see uh, reinvent that. And actually, I think, I think our whole tech narrative and digital narrative needs to be that, that being the best and the number one digital city is not about being bigger and having more Ubers, because frankly, I don't think most people in the city are really interested in that kind of culture. I think the definition of success can be great uh, economic success, but we take everybody with us. You know, so all the people who are here or come here to study uh, stay here because actually they want to be in an inclusive society that where technology benefits us all. But there you go. That's stuff. My little round. There you go. Uh, so we've got 20 minutes to 15 minutes if we squeeze it for questions. So I think we've got a mic floating about somewhere. I'm hoping we're going to have an army of questions from uh, the audience. Who, who's got a question for the panel? <laughs> Testing, one, two. No. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Neil. I'm a, a 3D artist and visualizer. Um, but currently, I'm developing in like VR and AR applications. I believe, Ged, you, you touched on VR. Um, so my question is, coming back to the future of uh, work, how do you see these applications affecting your particular industries? Do you want to take that, Ged? Do you want to just, just in incredibly uh, positively. Um, I mean, uh, um, we 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 started to develop it um, about two years ago, um, kind of under the radar, really, because it was got it was kind of a new thing. Um, I bumped into somebody in the city who was developing a company that that's, was starting to get. I think the Samsung Gear had just come on the market. And we, people were working out kind of how to how to do it, and we had to process our sort of 3D model externally. We had to send it out for it to be processed, to be brought back, to be kind of so that we could use it, so we could present it to clients. It kind of worked out that that was the the kind of future. So we some of our young guys, much clever, much cleverer than me, worked out how to do it, and now we do it internally. So we process all of our information internally. We only send out stuff that really needs to be, you know, to, to people like you, where it needs to be, you know, of a, a sort of, a, you know, fine presentation quality. But I, I've seen a massive kind of increase in engagement from clients and from end users in the process of architecture using exactly those tools. Um, that Clatterbridge Cancer Centre image you saw is the project that's on site at the minute. It's just, just coming out of the ground. And we always, every year, go through a, a sort of a client engagement sort of process. We basically put a big exhibition up, and all the nurses, the doctors, all the clinicians come and have a look, see what their new building's going to be like. And it's normally at lunchtime, it's normally at the hospital. So, so it's normally a struggle to get people kind of there and engaged, because not everybody can read a drawing. I mean, that's the reality, isn't it? For, for this engagement, we had two Samsung Gear sort of headsets with 10 images on each. And staff were coming, looking at them, going back to the departments and bringing back more staff. And people were kind of queuing out the door to come and engage with the process of architecture. Um, and I can see that that's the benefit. It's taking down the boundary of kind of reading a 2D drawing 
and bringing the thing to life, which is you know, just so kind of enticing. And I think there's, you know, there's, more, there's more to do with it. We're using Unity now to, to sort of render stuff and process models. You know, I don't want to get sort of too tech, techy, but it's just so, I'm so passionate that, that it's something that you know, really is going to make the profession much more kind of, you know, people are going to be able to, to engage with it much more. Great. Shall we go to another question? Gentleman there in the front row. Uh, how active is the panel at going to uh, graduate fairs and, and shows? Do you, have you ever been to a graduate show? graduate uh, shows we've got a resourcing team that pick that up but we do have we're really well connected with a lot of the universities around uh, Manchester because we do offer graduate placements within the co-op um, a big push for us though is that apprenticeships <coughs> piece so we're looking to uh, recruit a thousand apprenticeships this year so we're, we're really kind of looking at lots of different avenues Question. hello um, I'm on week seven, so we haven't yet, but in my last round at Australia, yes, very much so. Um, was it a slightly leading question, the New Zealand invitation? Because yes is the answer. <laughs> no, looking at me, I don't look like I'm a graduate, but a recent graduate, but I was last year. Uh, and I, went, I didn't go to this university, I went to Central Lanx. And I found, going to the graduate shows, it was a lot of mum and, mums and dads there, there wasn't many people from the industries there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as it's now a time of near full employment, so the Conservative government keeps telling us, is it not a time for the industry to be more proactive and actually go out to the shows that are there already and look around and talk to the graduates yeah. and find out what the personalities are like? Is, is what you're wanting at the end of the day is a good personality in, in your business? That's been the best way I've hired people in the past, and it's the best way that we've hired people that have not, the kind of golden moment comes from when you're just talking to someone. There's a lady who um, works for us that we bumped into at a graduate fair. I won't mention which university in this building. Um, but she was just like, oh, you want to speak to me? I've done maths. And we were like, stop. <laughs> we want to speak to you. And she was like, I don't want to do finance. We're like, no, stop. We have other departments. Because just the kind of logic and that thought process and that you do in maths is just a transferable skill set that would transfer into any roles and she's now one of our squad leads and um, she's she's doing absolutely amazing but having that we've all touched on that those skills around um, having that engagement being able to you know have that passion when you're having the conversation mm -hmm. you can't teach that we can mm -hmm. teach the technical skill that bit you know is is learn but I'm, I'm a massive fan of having those conversations but also getting the message out because so many people don't realize or understand when you talk about digital can we solely rely on educators to be able to talk about the full spectrum of roles? Because we probably couldn't talk about the full spectrum of roles because they're changing all the time. Um, and another graduate we, we took on at Australia when I was there on my last round of about three years ago, um, she's one of our um, user researchers. We met her at a graduate fair and she started talking to, to one of um, the seniors there and he sparked an interest. And she then followed us to every graduate fair we were due to go to for the next couple of months to the point where we didn't have a role, but I knew we needed to hire that person. So I actually sneaked her onto an experience assessment center just to get her in front of the managers because she showed that much dedication. She'd researched the organization that much. We had to hire her, even if we didn't have a role. And I did feel a little bit bad because two weeks after the assessment center, she did ring me going, Sarah, I've not heard. And I was like, I know that is because up until this point, I couldn't offer you a role and I was not rejecting you. Um, so I think it is so important. The more people we can speak to, how we do it at scale, I don't know. But if each organisation mm -hmm. did it, mm -hmm. then it would, it would go a long way. Sorry. So, so um, slightly challenging answer. No, not really. Um, I don't really go to graduate fairs. And um, it's partly because um, there's too many. Like there's a lot of organisation, there's a lot of academic institutions in this area, and we've got a need to be even-handed, uh, which means that we'd have to go to all of them, and we can't. So that it becomes really difficult at that point. And um, 
which isn't to say that we don't want to find good people. Of course we do. So what we end up doing is using kind of different types of industry events. So we'll do like um, in London when we're hiring there, we go to the Silicon Milk Roundabout and we'll do like we'll run or partner with things like UX Crunch to, to help and, and run our own events, which is why it's like look out for the industry events and go to them because we often find people that way. That's the way we do it. Um, yeah. I, I could reply to your, your earlier comments on uh, what you actually put into your, ad, your advertisements or job vacancy adverts. Yeah. Is Nothing I'm, I'm, good I must enough. be very unusual because yeah. if there's one or two things on, on that description and I don't fit them, I don't apply at all. So I'm obviously doing worse than the women applicants. <laughs> Uh, probably as an older person, it might be something, if that doesn't say what I am, I don't apply to it. Yeah. So should it be more general that you put your, ad your adverts out in a more yeah. general way? Rather so, than so let's get into the future of employment properly, which is what this is supposed to be about. Uh, I, I think that um, traditional apply with a CV, do an interview, doesn't work. Um, and that's what we're all stu stuck in. And we're still like most of our processes right now are kind of competency based. Can you tell me about a time when you showed leadership skills or whatever? We don't ask that question. Um, but it's things like that, you know, so we're asking for a kind of evidence based. All of that, it doesn't, um, it doesn't really manage to capture your strengths as a person. It doesn't show, because, you know, so we talk, I'm talking about strengths and competencies. Competencies are like a skill that you can show that you have. A strength is like something which is probably going to drive your ability to do lots of different skills. Um, like, we need to be able to move more to that. We need to be able to hire on the basis of, um, we're looking for people who can show creativity. And we can, tr you know, like we can, you can learn the rest on the job. That's not, you know, so it's uh, finding ways to move into kind of ways of, uh, you know, ways of selecting people on that, gr on, on from that basis. It's what's going to sort us out, and uh, it's going to allow us for better diversity as well. It's going to allow all these other facility, all these other things to happen. So rather than me showing you a do job like a list, a, like a shopping list of things I want out of a candidate, and you're going, well, I've got two of them, so I'm not applying because I need twelve. Like it should be more like, just tell us who you are and what you're about, mm -hmm. and then we'll figure out where we could slot you in, what that could be for our organisation. And that's that's going to be better. Our best hires are the ones where we've ended up going. We're going to shoehorn this job description around you because we want you because you're interesting and you're a bit weird and different from what we've got so far. Yeah. That's the best people we've got on our team. Yeah. So yeah, it's not perfect, but it'll get better. <laughs> Can we just make one last question then? Well, two, two quick questions, two half questions. <laughs> um, so I'm a second year undergraduate student. Sorry, I've never held a microphone before. Yeah. It's exciting, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not going to drop it. Um, so as a second year undergraduate student, we get told a lot, you know, work hard and you're going to get that job. But it's just, you know, just as helpful as uh, eat better and you're going to be healthy. Um, so if you were, you know, second year undergrad student, what kind of skills would you be working at in order to get the job with well, having no experience in the creative industry? Um, what things would you be reading? Like? Who's going to take, who's going to take a quick, quick answer? On I don't <laughs> like reading very much. Um, just finished doing that. English literature so it cures my habit of reading. Oh, a novel a week during finals. Bloody hell. Anyway, um, what do I think you should do? Uh, don't put up barriers about what you think good looks like. Don't f wait for a master plan about this is the career path that's going to let me in. Try everything all at the same time. Be super entrepreneurial about it. And, you know, you're going to end up going maybe to some meetups that you thought would be interesting and actually it's three blokes and they're doing Dungeons and Dragons and it's not what you thought. Fine. Do a lot of that. Lots of trial and error. Try everything. Um, but certainly don't put yourself into a box of this is the ideal career path for me. There's no such thing. Um, try a few things out. Um, damn, there was something else I was going to say and it was going to be really insightful and it was totally going to change your life, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Time. Continue to eat well, though.
do eat well. Do eat well, yeah. That's not it. <laughs> That's um, such a dad thing to say. <laughs> um, if you know what it is you want to do, I think that's the key start. If you know what job it is you want to do, and if you think, okay, who do I... Try and find someone who does that job, whether they work in Manchester or somewhere around or, or an organisation, and contact them. Go and talk to them. So if... I mean, I don't know what it is you want to do or what area you want to get into, but try and be as specific as you can so that you can nail down mm. what it is that you need to find out or what mm. skills you need to have and get mm. experience and talk to the people that do those jobs. Yeah. Um, go and meet them and find out about their companies that they work for yeah. and their opportunities that they have or find a mentor. Those kinds of things are going to yeah. help you. And then you might decide, oh, actually, sure, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to do something yeah. else. But it, it might either confirm it or not, and I think you have to. If, I think you have to be specific. If you're too general, it just um, y there's, there's so many pathways. Yeah. Um, and maybe if you don't want to be specific and you want to try lots of things and experience lots of other things, then then that's great as well. There's no yeah. true pathway to anything. But if you are specific about what you want to do, find out who those people are that you admire, that you like their work, that you want to ask questions. I think on that point as well, one of the things I would say to people is, like, I, I knew by kind of your age what I wanted to do, and I wanted to work. It quickly faded as soon as I got into industry, but I really wanted to work in the advertising industry, which famously at that point it was easier to get into being an astronaut than it was to get into advertising. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I would say the first 10 places I did placement, I hated, and I just thought, oh my God, I've got to be an absolute twit to work in this industry. <laughs> and then I found, an organisation where I love the people and I love the job. So I think it's also that thing of even if you know what it is, you, you, you've got to find, don't be put off by the first five companies that you might go and like photocopy for free for or whatever that might be because they might, it might not, you're not necessarily wrong for the industry, it might be just that's not the right company for you. So I think that just getting out and about more and experiencing people and places and you soon, you know, you could walk in the door of, all of your organisations, and I have done at some point, and you can tell the culture, you know, you can tell the feel, you can see whether you'd feel at home there, whether it's going to bring the best out in you as a person, and that, that's, you can only do that by walking the floor, really, can't you? Should we sneak one last quick question in, and then we're, we're done. Hello. Oh, God. Uh, I'm Jo, I, I teach on the graphic design course, so um, it's sort of a, a little bit of little questions here. So we've talked about um, how the industry is changing really fast, um, which I think quite often has to do with the language, which you've talked about, you've talked about strategy and words like that, which I don't think we cover enough in education. So the question is really, um, is how can universities work more closely uh, with industry to create better links, stronger links, to bridge that gap so that students are more in industry relevant, so they've got more current skills and particularly the language they need to in order to go for those job uh, adverts. Okay, should we, should we do a quick 30 seconds each down the line to finish and then? Um, so I've always got people on my team that need to practice doing presentations and students are a great way for them to get good at that. So there's actually development for us if we come and speak to university students. So lecturers, really, come and approach us and ask us to come and speak to your students. I can always find people for you. Um, and uh, that's fine. That's just blah, blah, blah at your face. Not all that good. Um, but there's also like, get us to set a brief and come back and comment on it as well. That's, I, I think that's things that, you know, certainly the BBC, like, again, back to our public purpose, part of what we're supposed to do is support the creative industry. And we can do that by helping universities. So there's, there's a direct way for, for you to get involved. I remember the thing I was going to say to you, make everything beautiful. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, bad, ugly shit will not work as well as beautiful <laughs> things do. It's a way of getting in the door. It's very true. It's very true. From an architect's viewpoint, I, th I think, again, that's something that, that's been recognised from the RBA generally, and probably in a quite a focused way locally, because now 
from Manchester University particularly and other universities in the region, I think Salford will follow fairly closely behind, this kind of a mentor program that's starting to be put in place, whereby we take, I think we took a dozen of students last year, uh, second years, and we basically have them in the office, go take them to meetings, so they kind of understand that once they are given a job, what it is they're going to be expected to do when they come in through the front door. So that, in, a, in any profession, I think that's a really important thing for, you know, for you guys to drive as teachers and for the profession to drive as responsible employers. Cool. Do my job. <laughs> um, it's always a challenge for us, I think, as well, because we are we've d those people who we need to get out there presenting, and, and it's a great way for us to develop people into what we would call a senior. And I think there's lots of avenues that have come up to get into primary, like the code clubs and inspiring the future and the STEM ambassadors. But the only way really we've ever managed to get into the classrooms and, and be able to support and, you know, selfishly, I suppose, in some respects, get word out about the opportunities we may have is when there's been kind of that alumni contact to an ex-student. And we try and leverage that as much as possible within the business. But I th if there was a way that we could... I think there is a gap. There needs to be something that's like Inspiring the Future and STEM Ambassadors that links companies up with universities that's kind of a bit more general uh, across the board that we, you know, you can put a call out, we can look out for it. Um, but until that happens, then all our contact details are on there, so go for it. Okay, so in classic me style, we've overrun, but thank you to everyone for coming today. And can we say a massive thank you to our inspiring panel today. <laughs> Only five minutes.